Uh, hello everyone, I am George Marquez. I'm going to be talking about some functional programming concepts and some applications on GDScript. So before I start, I want to ask uh, how many of you uh, have heard of functional programming? Okay, how many of you have used functional programming? Oh, there's a lot. <laughs> and how many of you know something about category theory? <laughs> Nobody, okay. <laughs> So I, I hope that some, uh, we learn something, everybody learns something today. Okay, before we start, I want to uh, present myself, uh, introduce myself. I'm a Godot contributor since 2015. Uh, I started with issue triaging, but then soon moved to actual development. And I'm a member of the project leadership since 2017. Uh, my experience in, with game is, uh, I work at, at Javery Games, which is a company in Brazil. And also IMVU, maybe someone have heard of it, and both using Godot. And uh, last November, I was hired actually by the Godot team, so I'm working full time for the project now. I'm also co author of the book Godot Engine Game Development in 24 Hours, that was published by Person. And uh, uh, one of my contributors is the UWP part and also type JDScript. So all the bugs that you got on JDScript is my fault. <laughs> <laughs> So here are a list of topics that we're, we're going to be working today. I'm uh, going to do some introduction about functional programming. Going to talk about some modern monads. <laughs> going to talk, uh, talk about some characteri characteristics of the functional programming paradigm. And uh, I'll talk about functions because that's what it's all about. <laughs> and some applications like applications in the real world that we can use and also like how to do that in JavaScript. And I also mention some other resources for people who want to learn more about it. So what it is, what is functional programming? Essentially everything is a function. Like uh, if you have like a functional language, uh, all that you have are functions. You don't have like objects or stuff like that. You just have functions and call it functions and the functions call other functions. Uh, you have a declarative uh, way of programming instead of imperative because we are used with imperative language that you, tell, you talk to the computer what to do. So do this and do that. Uh, declarative uh, programming is different. You tell the computer <coughs> what something is. So this is something and this is another thing. And it's kind of weird, but that's how it works. Uh, you have some application, like some practical applications of mathematical concepts. So the function is actually a mathematical concept. You probably uh, learned it in high school about mathematical functions. So it's the same concept applied with programming. Uh, another thing, we have like pure functions, which are functions that uh, uh, avoids changing the external state. I want to talk about a little bit more about this later. And also that functions are values, so they can be passed around essentially. And have some higher order functions, also I'm gonna cover this later. So let's talk about monads. Who heard about monads? So I have this quote, uh, that a monad is a monoid in an endofunctor category. So everybody learned already. <laughs> everybody <laughs> know what it is, right? <laughs> okay. So okay, let's not talk about this for now. <laughs> or, or maybe we, I don't know. <laughs> so there's some of the, of, of the disadvantages of using functional programming. That's why it's not like used everywhere. Uh, one thing is that the declarative code is actually harder to read because when you read the declarative code, you're not sure what's actually happening uh, with the stuff. And also actually not easy to write either, but reading is, I mean, uh, what's gonna happen when, you know, it's kinda hard to do, to understand what's going on, but, so uh, that's one disadvantage. So it's actually harder to get into it. Uh, it's hard to combine pure functions and intended side effects, because you want something to happen, but pure functions don't allow anything to happen because they are contained. So it's kinda hard to uh, deal with the side effects of the stuff. I'm gonna talk about side effects a bit later too, but the other thing is that uh, functional programming doesn't really use in loops. They usually use recursive functions. And that's kind of hard to understand and it can also be less performant than actually just doing a loop. Uh, actual functional programming languages sometimes have optimizations for that, but in general it, it kind of hurts the performance. Also immutability, because immutability means you're making copies all the time instead of actually changing stuff. Uh, but that's all. there's also some advantages about it. 
So the implementations, the implementation of a pure function, it's easier because it does what it needs to do, and that's it. So it's kind of easy to see. Okay, this does it. It's usually self-contained. Uh, it also is easier to run things in parallel because since you don't have side effects, you can just take this function and uh, run on every thread, and it just works because it's not like talking with anything else. You don't need synchronization points or anything like that. And also, it's easier to test because since it's self-contained, it's actually, oh, I just call this function and see if the result is expected. I don't need to mock anything. I don't need to set up a whole state of anything. It's kind of easier to test that. So let's talk about side effects. So by definition, it's changes in objects outside of the function scope. So if there is a function and it's changing something that's anywhere else, that's a side effect. So for instance, you have like a global state so you're, if you're changing the global state from the function, it's, it's having side effects. And what it means that the function called at different times may have different results because of this global state. And one example of this is input and output, actually, because the input from the keyboard is something external. And also the output like to the monitor is something external. You're changing the state. So the function can have different uh, behaviors, the, a different return value because of the inputs or the outputs. And something is that if you have an object and the object, the object has a method and the method changes the state of the object, that's also a side effect. Uh, another thing that's uh, common in functional programming is the immutability, which is essentially you're not allowed to change stuff. If you need to change it, you make a copy and then return the copy with the altered value, essentially. So each variable is essentially a constant. So you cannot, like you sometimes you cannot uh, rebind uh, a new value to a variable, like assign a new value to a variable because you don't change it. And you're not allowed to change the properties of an object because if there's an object and you change the properties, you're causing side effects. You, you're like, you're, make, you're mutating the object. So it's not immutable anymore. So, but it's okay to change the object that you created on the function because you create on the function and then changing the properties for initialization purposes and then just return the object. But that's a new object. That's not like changing something that you receive as a parameter, for instance. So the, the idea is to change, instead of changing the object in the function, just returning nothing, you change your object, you update the object by making a copy, updating its val the values of the copy that you created and then return that new object. And the original object is the same, it's unchanged. Uh, and this relates to the pure function that I talked about, which is a function that has no side effects. So all the parameters that you get in the function are immutable. So in, when you call a pure function, you have this contract, you have this certainty that the object that you're passing around won't be changed. And also, uh, the, the main idea is that a call with the same arguments returns always the same value. And that's like uh, the, what makes it also easier to test. Because, I mean, that's the same arguments is the same value. So if I can do a lot of tests with different arguments and I know the, the values are not gonna be changed. I don't need to change anything in the global state. It's completely independent of the global state or the object state. And I can make sure of that. So it's a similar to the mathematical definitions I'll talk about, which is a correlation between the values that you input and the values of the output. So it doesn't need to have anything else. It's just the function. So talking about that, we have the first class functions, which is that the function is also a value, which means that you can assign functions to your variable. You can pass functions as arguments to other functions, and you can return a function as a result of another function. So everything that can be done with a variable with any value can be done with a function as well. So we can like make a array of functions or a dictionary where the key is a string and the value is a function, for instance. And that can be used for uh, other things about the higher order functions that I'm gonna mention a bit later. So what about that in GDescript? Uh, unfortunately, we don't have that yet, but I'll be working on it. So soon we'll have it good or for, we'll certainly have uh, first class functions in GDescript. But, we can use Funcref right now. And Funcref is a, is a very exclusive to Godot thing that is a type that 
contains an object and a string that's a name for a function. And you can use that to actually call the function and pass arguments to it. So you can make the same thing that you can do with first class functions, essentially, because it's also a value. So the way to make it into the script, you just call the, the functref keyword, pass the object, which is in this case itself, and pass the string with the method name. So that works. Essentially, you can use this value, this my func uh, variable, you can pass it around, you can send it to other functions, you can return the value. It's the same thing as having first class functions, essentially. And then you later you can call it by using the function call func in this func ref object. And then you can pass any arguments that the, the method actually can receive. So that can be used in GenDescript right now. So with that, we can make higher order functions. So the functions by definition are first order by default, and then you can get higher orders when they use functions as arguments or they return a function as a result, essentially. Because when you actually do passing functions around, then this function turns out to be a higher order. And they don't need to be pure, essentially to be a higher order, but we like more if they are actually pure because it's, it's the functional programming idea that functions are generally pure. So some examples of higher order functions are map, filter, and reduce. They're also not available on JavaScript because since it doesn't have a first class functions, it doesn't make sense to have them right now. But eventually it's going to have it uh, sometime soon. So the other thing is that, so let's talk about those functions as well. So let's talk about map. So map is a function that takes an array you know, an array, any array, and another function. That's an unary function, which means that it takes one argument for this function. And what it does, it returns a copy of the array with this function that you pass applied to every element of it. So here's the signature. Essentially, you have the input array, and you receive also uh, a function, which is like a func ref, and returns a copy of the array. So it's equivalent to, oh, this slide's a bit unformatted, but, uh, you have an array, and you create a new array with the mapped values. And essentially, you, you append, you call the function with each element in this loop, and append to the, re to the result. And then you re just have the result. So one example of this map function to use is like you have a function that calculates the half of a value. So it returns essentially the number divided by 2. And then you have an array of numbers, and then you just map this half function to this func ref self to this array of numbers. So this is also a pure function that uses map, the half array. So essentially, like in ready, for instance, you make the numbers, and then you pass this array to the numbers. So now you have all, all every number in the array is halved. So that's one use of this function. Another example is, for instance, you have a, a function that gets the ID of the user. So you, for array of users, you can make this array of users just the array of the IDs of these users. So you can also do maybe two other properties. Let me just want the array of all the names. So you have already have the array of users, you map with the get name function, and then you have array of names of users. And it's like a similar idea over here. Uh, this, for example, is a possible implementation of this map function in JavaScript. So essentially we have the result, we create a copy, then we do resize to be the same size because the result will be the same size. We already know it. And then uh, for each element, we call the function that you passed for each element of the source array and we append it to the result array and then we return that. Guys is missing the return line, but <laughs> I think you can understand that. Uh, this is a bit, okay. <laughs> so the filter function, uh, the, the name is quite, uh, it's quite obvious what it does, but essentially you have an array and a unary function, same way as map, but instead you have a new array that only have the elements for which the function returns true. Otherwise, the element won't be in the, the new array. Uh, it's a bit, maybe a bit hard to see because the formatting got weird, <laughs> but essentially you call some function and only if this function returns true, then you append the element to the result. So the array can make be smaller with just the elements that passes. So let's see an example of that. So for instance, you have a function that see if the number is even, essentially. 
and then you have another function to get all the even numbers in an array. So essentially you have, you call filter with the numbers and use the is even function as the actual function. So when you call something with one, two, three, four, and you try to get evens, it's only two and four because that's the only values where is even will return true. So it's a way to essentially filter the array for only the values that you want. So for example, you can have a function that see if a if an user is active. Then for the array of users, you can actually s get only the active users. So, oh, okay, I have all the users here, but how many of them are active? I mean, which one of them are active? So you just call this and you have all the active arrays. And you can see that like you're reading this is actually quite, quite easy to read because I mean, I want to filter the users with the is active function. So I know you have the, all the is active users. I mean, it's quite easier to understand what's going on. So this is one possible implementation you do script, where essentially, I mean, you for you do a for loop for each, every element, and then you call the function. If the function is true, you up you append it to the result, and at the end you return the result. That's super simple to do. The other high order function that's really useful is reduce. That's a bit harder to explain and to understand maybe. But essentially, instead of a unary function, you have a binary function. So it takes two arguments. And those two arguments are essentially uh, uh, two values that are in the array. So you can also have uh, an initial value. So essentially, you pick the initial value and then pick the first ele element of the array. And then you apply the function to both. And this result you apply, you pick up the next element and you apply this function to both and you get like one result and then you apply to the next element of the array until it finishes. So it takes an array and returns only one value. That's not like, it's not an array anymore, it's just one value. So it's equivalent to essentially you have like the one, two, three array and then the reduced is like a base value that you started with and then for each element in the array you call the function with this, with this reduced value and the element, and it's applied just to reduced. So you apply for each element uh, and you get just one value. So let's see one example of that's made, made be, that will be make it, it clear. So I have the sum function, which just takes two numbers and add them together. So how do sum every element of the array? I call reduce with the numbers and the sum function, and the starting one is zero because I start with zero. So you have one, two, three, and four array, and uh, I try to s call the array sum. It will essentially will apply this reduce function for each element, and then the result is one plus two plus three plus four, essentially, which is 10. So another example, you have like one function that takes the larger of each element. So if, if, number, if number one is larger, then it returns that, otherwise it returns, it returns num two and another function to get the user age, for instance. So now you can get the highest user age because you can uh, just uh, map. So now you are combining map with reduce. So you map the users uh, with the get user age. So now you have the array of users and you map the you get user age. So now you have an array of ages. So now you can reduce this rare array of ages with the larger function. So you get the largest age that you have in your database. And again, it's quite easy, easier to follow because the name of the functions kind of make it easier. So I would just fetch users and get user age of each function and then just get the larger num. So I know this is the largest age in the database. And this is one possible implementation of this in JDScript, uh, which is essentially you have an accumulator uh, and it gets the base. This is a bit harder because you have to consider the case where the base is omitted. But essentially the accumulator is the first input if there's no base, otherwise it's the, the, it's the base itself. And then you, you run through the array and call the function for each uh, intermediate result until we get to the end and just return the final accumulated result. That's very simple. I'll try to share the presentation later so you can like, see the code and use the, and use the functions if you want. Uh, so moving on from high order functions, I'm going to talk about lambdas. And a lambda is a function definition where a value is expected. What it means is instead of making it a function ref, 
you actually do the body of the function inside the, 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 the place where the value is expected. For instance, we don't have like lambdas in JavaScript, but this is kind of like Python that you have x and you, ha you return x divided by 2. So you can map this thing with uh, uh, just a function definition right there instead of de defining it elsewhere. And then you can get the proper result. So lambdas in JavaScript, we're not there yet, but <laughs> Uh, there's also a plan for Godfrey 4 to have l actual lambdas in JavaScript. So let's move on. Let's talk about bit theory. I promise it's only bit. It's not super hard. So <laughs> the first thing I want to talk is functor. Uh, has anyone heard about functor before? Oh, there are some people here. Nice. And so th there's no need to flee. It's not that hard to do. <laughs> but it's, it's very simple. Like functor is a type that can be mapped. And that's it. If you have a type and you have a map function that can be applied to that type, so that type is a functor. So we say that the array is a functor because as we just saw, you can make a map function for array and it, like, it makes sense. So that's it, array is a functor. I mean, there's a lot of, of category theory because functor is actually a map between one category and another, but that doesn't really matter for what we're doing now. And uh, essentially, I mean, we don't have like the map function defined in array itself, but that's like doesn't really matter uh, conceptually, because in functional programming, in functional programming languages, you don't really have objects in there. So, the the point is that array can have a map function, doesn't matter where it is. The other one is monoid. Maybe you heard of monoid as well. <laughs> yeah. So, the monoid is 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 a type and it has a function that applied for this type that has these three properties. One is that's binary. It essentially has two parameters, simple. It's associative. So if you call with B, C first and then A, or if you call with A and then B uh, and then C, it doesn't really matter because it, you can do like in any order essentially because that's the one important point. And it has a neutral or identity element. So if you call the uh, a value with identity, doesn't matter which order, you also you will just get the same value back again. And it doesn't need to be commutative. So if you change the order of the arguments, it can actually have a different value. That's not a problem for a monoid. So for example, you have the integer type and you have the sum function. So it's also a binary function because it takes two arguments, three and four in this case is associative. If you do one plus two first and then add three, it's, oh, it works. Or if you do two plus three first and then one plus the result is going to be six, it's going to be all the same. And it has the identity element with zero because if you sum with zero, it doesn't matter, it just gives the same value back. Okay. So another example is that we already seen is array because if you use the concatenation function with an array, you can have the same properties. It's a binary because you have two elements to concatenate. Uh, is associative because if you do this concatenation first and then this one, uh, it doesn't matter because you can do this one first and then this one, the result is gonna be the same. But as I say, it doesn't need, it doesn't need to be commutative. So if you change the order of the arguments, the result is gonna be different, but that's not really a problem for this. And the identity element is an empty array because if you concatenate an empty array with any other array, the results are going to be the other array, just the same thing. So let's go back to the monads. So let's talk about it. So as I said before I, I, in the quote, a monad is a monoid in an endofunctor category. Uh, what it means essentially is that a monoid, a monad is a monoid that's also an endofunctor. And in programming, essentially every functor that you has is an endofunctor. So in other words, a monad is a monoid that is also a functor. So we, we learned about, about functor, we learned about monoid, so you have to have both, so it's a monad. Which that means that array is a monad. So that's it. I mean, it's a functor because it can be mapped, and it's a monoid because it has the binary function that it can be applied to it with all the properties. So it's also a monad. So I'm gonna, gonna be through a different way right now, but I'm gonna go back to it. So I'm gonna talk talk about promise. Maybe you probably heard about promise in other languages like JavaScript in particular. But essentially, it's 
uh, meant to encapsulate an asynchronous, asynchronous operation. So you can do like you reserve a, a promise back that I mean you try to do an asynchronous operation and just receive a promise that it's gonna happen at some time in the future and just can keep working other stuff while you wait for that essentially. And it allows to maintain the chain of operations until this promise is fulfilled, until it's completed. So essentially the, the promise can be treated as the value that you're gonna uh, get a result from this operation as well. So it, happens, it helps to suppress the side effects because this operation can be like a, a web request. And I mean, this can be a different value at different times. So we're not sure what's gonna happen. But you can use like the promise. The promise is always the same. You know, you always have this promise. You can treat this promise without considering the side effects that's gonna gonna happen. Uh, for example, I'm gonna do essentially a promise implementation in JavaScript. So I have a class name promise. It has a success signal, which happens with when the promise is succeed. You may have one two like error signals or don't signals when either it's success or error, but for the simplicity, I omitted those. And essentially when we have what happens as a success function, uh, this just sets the down to true and it emits this, the success signal. So whoever is using this implementation, we call this success function and everybody using promise, like it's connected already, they know what to do. For example, we have like uh, the HTTP request, which is a bit complicated because it's not like super, easy to do HTTP requests in JavaScript is a bit verbose. Like it's easy, but it's verbose. Well, it's essentially I create a new HTTP request node and I call some URL with uh, parameters that you pass like width and height of, of the image. And then I connect the, the request completed signal of this node to this function down here. And then I create a new promise and then I just return this promise. And this promise is stored in the class here. So when it happens that we get back the image from the HTTP request, we set, we created like an, J, uh, an image from the JPEG that we got, and we set the, the texture from, we set the, uh, we create a new texture from this return value, and we just call the success function of the promise with this new texture, essentially. So how do you use that? Essentially, on ready, you can have like a kit and promise, and you get, you make a request for, for an image of 800 by 600, and then you connect this promise that you got back to this function. So the thing is that the, this function, for instance, it just sets the sprite. It doesn't care about anything about web. It just sets the texture. And this, the ready function just called the, the function. It takes the promise back and just connected the success signal to this. So the other code, the other code is a bit complicated. So you have, you kind of get the, the, the kitten back, so essentially. But I mean, you can see that this is super complicated to do, but the actual use actually can get very simple. And it's actually really easy to do this happen. And then you get like a cute kitten back. <laughs> so, so about promise and functional programming is that the promise is also a monad. So the thing about monads is that they can encapsulate the side effects the same way the promise does with like uh, asynchronous requests. So for instance, in array, the contest is the multiplicity of values. Maybe the result is not really certain. So we have multiple possible results. You don't know that for sure until sometime in the future. So you can have a, like array is just a contest that, oh, all these values can be true at some point, And I don't know which, but you can apply operations to this array, like, like it were the final result. And later when you actually have the final result, you can maybe have, oh, the, the fifth, uh, element in the array is actually the correct one, but you already mapped the o of over other functions. You already know the actual final result after all the operations you want to apply, essentially. Uh, in the promise, the contest is the promise of this asynchronous operation that are gonna uh, eventually end and return the value, essentially. Then so you can treat like the value is already there and just uh, keep operation this. And then when the promise is eventually fulfilled, uh, then the, the side effect the side effect will be applied and you can get like the kit and image essentially. Uh, so to put, this is like a, uh, like a jargon, usually called lift when you put a value inside the contest. So if you put a value in the promise, you're actually lifting the value to become a promise 
the same way as adding to an array. So how promise is a functor, for instance? Uh, how, how do you map uh, promise? Essentially, you, you take uh, the function they're applying and you apply it to the promised result. Even if you don't have it yet, the promise will eventually end and fulfill, be fulfilled. So at this point, the promise implementation will apply the, the function to the result. So what happens is that uh, when you map something, you actually keep the stuff inside the context. Like the monad is a context, but you map, it keeps the context. So when you map into an array, you get an array back. So when you map in a promise, you get a promise back. So essentially the new promise that you get back is the value that you get for the first one applied with the function that you passed. So it, this will also be fulfilled in the future. So essentially you can apply like pure functions in the promise value without having to worry about the side effects of the promise itself. So for example, the, this implementation, implementation of, the, of, of, of the use of the mapping in promise, essentially. So you can like request users, but this can be like uh, a file system operation that may take some time, or maybe a web request. But then you can map this function with the filter active users, with this one, you just a filter with this is active value, is active function. And then, I mean, you can just map this and then connect the success, the success signal with the print users. What's gonna happen is that this print user function will be called only with the active users because we were already filtering them. But you can see that you only do this straightforward. I mean, you don't need to wait for the promise to complete to call the function. You just map another function over it. So when this finally finishes it, you don't need to do the steps when it finishes. You can already do it then before. I mean, in practice, in practice, it will only gonna happen later, but in your code, you can do just everything straightforward and don't need to do like a lot of waiting around for stuff. So it's kind of easier to understand and easier to read and you also make use of the pure functions. So if you need to test this, it's kind of easier to test like this function, the filter function, because you just pass an array and you get an array back. So it's easier to test. You don't need to care about all the promise, all the request stuff. The, so also the same thing with the print function actually, because just just printing, you just need to check if it's actually printing. So, uh, so that's the idea of monad because monads uh, can be used as a side effect isolation. So you can operate on values that are not really there because they're inside some context, but you can allow the functions that you have that apply to an element to apply to the same element, but inside some other context. For instance, uh, you can operate in a text input, but text input is actually a side effect because you can have different values at different times. So, but you can operate on this input by mapping over some context that uh, isolates the actual input function. So they only need to get, so you can have a, a function that only gets text as an argument, and then there's a monad that isolates the context of actually getting the user input. I mean, if you ever used Haskell, that's essentially how it works on Haskell. Uh, every like side effect and IO operation are monads, essentially. So this way you can keep the side effects in a small portion of the code, only on the monad code, and and all the shared state as well because that's where everything happens. So that makes it easier to to have a control of every, what has, what's happening because all the most of the functions of your game, for instance, are pure. So it's easy to test those. But that's those small part of shared uh, object state of side effects, you can keep those small and you can test those on isolation so you can track where the bug actually is when you find them. So, so after this, I want you to try, if you never tried, try to learn some functional programming language, you have the interest, uh, because the concepts uh, can be applied to any language. Like I said, in JavaScript, you can also apply those, co those concepts in JavaScript. And it's quite nice to have another idea of how programming works. It's, it's like opens your mind to other stuff. Even if you don't use like full time, have, have everything is a pure function, doesn't need, doesn't need to be like that. But on some places actually can be helpful to use those concepts, even if it's not a programming, uh, functional programming language. 
So one example is our Elm, which is like a web framework, essentially, that is very functional. So if you like web, you can use this language to learn and some functional concepts. Also, like if seeing the web stuff happening is actually quite interesting. Elixir is like more traditional language. It's based on the Erlang uh, virtual machine. Of Haskell, that's very specific, but it's very also, it really enforces the functional paradigm. So it's kind of hard to learn, but you kind of, you are like, you have to use functional. There's no like other way to do it. So if you want to learn to be forced to use functional programming, that's, that's the language tree for you. Uh, both Clojure and Scala are functional programmings that are applied to the JVM, the Java Virtual Machine. So if we're used to Java, essentially every place that can run Java can also run those languages, so it can be used for a lot of stuff. And F Sharp is the same thing, but for the, CL, the CRL, it's the, the Microsoft, essentially the C Sharp runtime that we always use. And that's it, questions? Thank you. Uh, in regards to things that we're going to have available in Godot, maybe four, uh, uh, can you tell us about how much of these things will be available? And specifically, if we are going to have uh, things like partials, cache for pure functions, and lazy evaluation, for example? Uh, so the idea is not to make GDScript like a functional language. I just want to bring some of the stuff to GDScript so you can. I mean, lazy evaluation, you just need to make it in e scripting code. There's nothing like this. It will be available like beauty. Uh, but you have something like, like I said, like first class functions, some higher order functions, some stuff that helps you, but not, not, it's not enforced to use because JavaScript is still a scripting language that's meant to be simple. So if I start adding this stuff, it kind of gets really tricky to use and to implement them. So that's why we would not like to go in this direction, actually, because it's too object oriented in the end. So hope that answers the question. <laughs> Good. Some other question? If uh, we are going to get some um, higher functions and so on on GDScript for version 4, um, might we get some sugar syntax to declare decorators like in Python? Decorators. So that's one discussion that we actually have on the, we had on the Godot Sprint before Fosden, that we want to add uh, annotations and some people want to make like user defined annotations and how that's gonna work. I'm still not sure if they're gonna be decorators, but maybe. I mean, we're still de defining this. So if you have a proposal for this, something, you can use the Godot proposals repository and like make, I mean, how you want to use that. So you can check like use cases and make like a proper implementation that fits that the, the real user cases, okay? Hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, I want to ask, you said that functions will be first, uh, like, uh, like mm. there, will be, there will be functions as first class citizens in 4.0. Okay. Uh, I want to ask, uh, are signals gonna change how like the syntax, how you use them, because right now you just pass a name of a string, and when you have like uh, functions, I think mm -hmm. like it will be easier to just pass the function itself. Yeah, what happens actually, you, we're gonna have first class signals as well. So the signal is like a, another member of the object. So you can, in the signal object, you have the connect function where you just pass a reference to a function. I mean, you don't need to do the way we do now. It's an object an object and a function name. Now we can just pass a reference to the function. So it, it will gonna change and hopefully it's gonna be super easier to do. So that means without using the funcrest? 
yeah, don't need to use funk ref. Uh, probably you will not gonna have funk ref anymore because it's not needed because you can just use the function itself as a reference. Thank you. Welcome. Some other question? Just a comment from the outside. Uh, thank you very much for all that you brought. Mm -hmm. And it's just about the terms, and it's not directed to you. It's just directed to the general um, programming community. Just to, as an information, uh, the term of uh, monad is coming from the philosophy uh, background, and it's attri often attributed to Leibniz while being uh, a lot earlier. And the term of purity is also has been a long history, a political history that is problematic. And I just wanted to put a word on that. Okay, thank you for sharing. If nobody else? I had a quick question. Do you plan to add the map filter reduce to array? Actually, yes. <laughs> That's nice. Okay, uh, thank you everyone. Thanks for having me and bearing with all this weird stuff. <laughs> <laughs>